Please uh, distinguish delegates and participants, dear colleagues. Very good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zone. And welcome to FAO in Geneva uh, trade talk session today. My name is Dominique Burgeon. I'm the director of the FAO uh, liaison office in Geneva, and I will be moderating today's session. As you may already know, FAO in Geneva is organizing a series of webinars in collaboration with uh, the FAO Markets and Trade Division. Through this series, our objective is to share information on relevant and timely topics at intersection of trade and agriculture. I would like to thank you uh, for taking the time to attend our webinar today, given the busy agenda uh, in Geneva uh, at this point. Before starting our event, allow me to share some details regarding the logistics. As you all know, uh, our webinars will be in English only with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will be later available on our uh, website. It is scheduled to last for about one hour. We have reserved some time towards the end of the, the webinar for a Q&A session. So please submit your question in the Q&A module. Sometimes even panelists prefer to respond directly in writing, but there will be uh, opportunities for, for, uh, for engaging also uh, verbally. And I would ask you to put your, your question in the Q&A module, of course, uh, stating your name and organization. Uh, if you have any problem, uh, please uh, use the, the chat uh, module so that we can, uh, we can help you. Uh, as you, uh, so that's all for the, the, the housekeeping today. And I would like to take a, a few moments to present FAO's work today, topic, and our speaker and panelists. Uh, FAO support members' efforts to formulate trade policies that are conducive to uh, improve food security by strengthening evidence and analysis, providing capacity development, and facilitating a neutral dialogue away from the negotiating table. In this spirit, the FAO in Geneva agricultural trade talks are based on an approach we call the three I's, informal, interactive, and inspirational. And let me now briefly touch upon today's topic. A robust and well-integrated global agricultural system can help all countries withstand unprecedented challenges, as evidenced during the COVID-19 pandemic in early 2020, when global agri-food markets proved to be remarkably uh, res resilient. Trade policies play an important role in shaping food and agricultural markets and have significant influence on trade flows. Efficient trade can promote world food security and better nutrition, and therefore trade policies in food and agriculture should aim to safeguard global food security address trade-offs between economic, social, and environmental objectives and strengthen the resilience of the global agri-food system. At WTO 12th Ministerial Conference, conference in June 2022, as part of the package of agreement known as the Geneva Package, WTO members adopted outcomes on agriculture, namely a ministerial declaration on the emergency response to food insecurity and a ministerial decision on exempting world, the World Food Programme humanitarian food purchases from export prohibition or restriction. These outcomes aim to address food shortages and soaring food price and ensure that the most vulnerable can access emergency food aid. WTO members have already started to reflect on them, particularly the Declaration on Food Insecurity, which underlines member commitment to uh, improving global food security and improving the functioning and resilience of global food markets. The, 22, the 2022 edition of the FAO flagship report, the State of Agricultural Commodity Market, known as the SOCO, under the team, the Geography of Food and Agricultural Trade Policy Approaches for Sustainable Development, discusses how trade policies based on both multilateral and regional approaches can address today's challenges for sustainable development. It explores the geography of trade, analyzing food and agricultural trade and its patterns across countries and regions, its drivers and the trade policy environment. In today's session, FAO will present the main highlights of this report and will explain the findings in more detail. Before presenting our 
speakers and panelists, I would like to take this opportunity to make a very short to take to make also a very short announcement. The session of the trade talks takes place in an important week for FAO. On 16 October, indeed, as you all know, FAO celebrates World Food Day to mark the day of the establishment of FAO in 1945. The celebration this the celebration this year are taking place under the theme Leave No One Behind, with a call for global solidarity and collective action to make sure that no one is left behind through the transformation to more efficient, inclusive, sustainable, and resilient agri-food systems for better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life, uh, of course, leaving no one behind. Through this week, a series of activities are organized in Geneva and throughout Switzerland, Switzerland with the collaboration of the Swiss Federal Office uh, for Agriculture and other partners. And more details on this can be found on our uh, website. Now, turning back to our session, today we have, we have Ms. Andrea Zimmer, Zimmerman from FAO with us. Ms. Zimmerman is an economist in the Market and Trade uh, Division of FAO. And following Ms. Zimmerman's presentation, we'll hear from our three panelists who will share insights on the topics. And our panelists today, and I would like to warmly welcome them and thank them for their participation, are uh, uh, Excellency Ms. Tim Shanok Pitfield, Permanent Representative of Thailand to the WTO, Ms. Michelle Bielik, Acting Executive Director of the Strategic Trade Policy Division at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and Mr. Marcel Vernoy, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Netherlands to the WTO and current Chair of the WTO Committee on Agriculture. We'll now move to the, the presentation uh, from Andrea. Uh, we'll present the report. And as I mentioned earlier, please don't, do not hesitate to put uh, questions you may have uh, using the, the Q&A uh, module. So Andrea, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Dominic. Good afternoon, everyone. I just um, start sharing my screen. Okay, I hope you cannot see my slides. Uh, thank you again, Dominic, for the for the introduction. As Dominic has um, said already. Um, the topic of uh, this year's edition of SOCO is um, the geography of food and agricultural trade. And through this lens, a, ge a geographic lens, um, I will focus a bit today on globalization processes in food and agricultural trade and implications that this could have for, food, for global food security. And we will also have a look at the fundamental drivers of trade, interlinkages between um, trade and the environment, and finally, also policy approaches for trade to contribute to sustainable development. So let me start with, um, with the globalization processes. These are two very basic figures uh, referring or showing the globalization in food and agricultural trade. The first one shows the evolution of the value of food and agricultural trade um, from 1995 to 2019. And, uh, what we can see, there has been a rapid increase in the value of food and agricultural trade, especially here in this time period between 2000 and 2010, 2011, so a clear globalization process. And the second figure also refers or shows globalization, but it's a bit different. Uh, this figure actually shows the, the linkages between trading partners. So it shows the, the green bars show the total number of country pairs that um, traded food and agricultural products again from 1995 um, until 2019. And um, so what again here we see this, this uh, pathway of globalization. Today in 2019, there are many more countries um, connected with each other. So many more countries do trade food and agricultural products with each other. And um, also here the the main, uh, the, uh, the most rapid process has been uh, around the year 2000 for the connectivity of countries. In both figures, we see this sort of a bit leveling off or slow down of globalization in the last decade. So this was the, the basic patterns of globalization. 
in the report, we also looked at, um, at structural changes in the network of um, global food and agricultural trade. And this is what this figure shows um, on, on the left from 1995 and on the right for 2019. And um, so for so it's really what is depicted here is the network of trade, the large, uh, the, the circles, all of these circles denote countries, and the colors just indicate um, different regions. And what we can see in 1995 is um, that we have a few um, large players, large traders in the food and agricultural um, network, and these are um, located at the very center of the network. So most of the global trade was somehow um, allocated around these central players, large players in the market. And then in um, 2019, this pattern had completely changed. We still have large circles, large players in the, in the global market, but there are many more of them now in 2019, and they are not so centralized anymore. So they moved out of the center and there's a clear process of decentralization that we can see in, in the global network of food and agricultural trade. So we've seen the, the globalization, the changes in the, in the structure of trade. And the question is, what does this imply for, for the resilience um, of, of countries to shocks in their, in their trading partners. And this is what we can see in, this, uh, in these two figures. The first figure, the upper figure shows um, a basic measure of the connectivity of countries. So it basically shows the distribution of connectivity across countries, how many uh, trading partners countries connect to. And in, in green, we have the area in green for 1995 and what this shows is that um, in 1995, there were only very few countries here located at the right tail um, that really had a high connectivity that used to trade with many trading partners. But most of the countries here in the peak of the distribution, they had a relatively low connectivity. Um, they traded only with a few trading partners. And then between 1995 and 2007, this pattern had completely shifted, the, uh, the distribution had complete, completely shifted to the right. So it became much more symmetric and trade became much more balanced. So what we have now is we have um, many more countries that trade with more trading partners. So most of the countries are somewhere located here with an average, um, and they, they are connected to a sort of average number of trading partners. And, um, this, of course, implies that, um, that the global network of food and agricultural trade has become more resilient. If you have more countries that are better connected among each other, it's easier for these countries. Um, if, for example, one of the trading partners would, would drop out to, um, to source imports from one of the other trading partners because there are established trade relationships already. So this is the overall pattern, an increase in resilience to shocks. But then if we look at the second figure, um, it's, uh, it gives a completely different pattern. And the second figure also shows connectivity, but it now focuses more um, on the, it, it shows actually how many food and agricultural products are traded through these individual links. And what we can see is a much higher concentration to, uh, still in 2019, um, most of the countries here used to trade um, only few specific products um, with specific trading, with few specific trading partners. Um, so there is a lot of concentration. And this, of course, implies that countries can be more vulnerable to shocks. Um, it's, we see that, for example, the, the V trade network is one uh, of the most concentrated networks. And, and we see what is happening now with the, with the war in Ukraine. There are, there are many countries that are highly dependent on, um, on trade, on imports from the, from the countries that are affected by the crisis. And this has, of course, um, repercussions on global trade and uh, global food prices. Um, so this is the, the, 
development of the resilience um, to shocks. Again, even here, we can see that in 1995, the concentration was still much, much higher. So it, it has already become a bit better that countries are still encouraged to diversify the import sources to, to become more resilient to shocks in their trading partners. So that was sort of the, the global pattern um, we also looked at regionalization tendencies in food and agricultural trade. And uh, this is depicted in, in, in this figure, which shows the evolution of, of trade clusters over time. And what we found is that um, trade intensity is usually higher within rather than across regions. And this is why we, we, um, we arrive at these regional trade clusters. All of these clusters or most of these clusters are actually shaped by geographic proximity, by similar preferences, and also by trade agreements. So in some of these clusters uh, are really very stable. There's only one, one exception, and that is Africa, which has not really formed a, a stable regional cluster so far. So we can see the, the colors um, in Africa changing over time. That's because the countries in Africa used to connect to different trade clusters, but there's no dedicated African trade cluster. Um, and this is also reflected in, in this map which shows the, the general connectivity at country level of the country. So we see countries in dark purple that are very well connected, that have many trading partners, but it's again African countries that are not so well connected and that only uh, trade with few trading partners. Um, so the question is, um, why, why is that? And that brings us to the, to the fundamental drivers um, of trade. Again, we see here um, the, the figure, the map shows um, the level of competitiveness um, by country and the countries in, in purple, they are highly competitive. Countries in green, especially again in Africa, are not so competitive compared to, to the other countries in the global markets. And at the same time, we also found that comparative advantage, so the ability to produce at lower opportunity cost, um, the, the strength, the influence of comparative advantage was relatively low um, in Africa. So countries in Africa are not, so, are, are not so specialized and there's not even so much incentive for them to, to exchange the trade with each other. That was comparative advantage. A second important driver of trade is of course trade costs. And here again, we find that um, European countries, if they trade among each other, they have relatively low trade, average trade costs. But at the same time, we have African countries that um, if, they, if they trade with each other, they have on average much, much higher trade costs. So again, this is something that, that hinders um, intra-African trade, high trade costs. And, um, and trade costs, of course, they, they include and consist of, um, of tariffs. They are related to all costs related to transportation and um, also logistics. And, and also, of course, costs related to the compliance with the standards, food safety standards, for example. Um, so what could be done to boost intra-African trade and also economic growth is to, is to lower the trade costs, to bring trade costs down. And this could, for example, happen through trade facilitation um, as promoted um, by the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. And it could also happen through regional approaches like the um, African Continental Free Trade Area, where there's a lot of hope that this regional, this large regional agreement would boost trade within the continent. Um, so these were the drivers of trade. We also looked, like I said, on the, um, at the interlinkages of um, trade with the environment. And an example for that is shown in, in this map. So the, the, red, the triangles, um, they show countries that, um, that face uh, high water stress levels. And the countries shown in purple are countries that are highly dependent on imports of food and agricultural products. And the relationship here is very clear. Countries that face high water stress levels, 
they have difficulties, they cannot produce um, so much, so many agriculture and food products. So they depend much more on imports than other countries. So this implies that, um, that trade can promote food security as it allows countries to overcome land, uh, to overcome water, but also land constraints to meet their food requirements. And at the same time, through, through comparative advantage and through the unequal distribution of natural resources across the world, trade, of course, can also result in, in water and also land savings by allocating production to, to the areas, to the regions that are most efficient in the resource use. So these are the positive effects um, of trade on the environment and on food security. And of course, there were some negative um, externalities. We know that production, um, agricultural production, and then of course also production for exports can generate negative environmental impacts, like for example, unsustainable freshwater withdrawals and also greenhouse gas emissions. And to address these, there's an increasing number of, of trade agreements um, that actively try to address environmental externalities. Um, so it's the WTO rules that um, do allow that there is policy space to protect the environment, but it's also what the figure shows is an increase in regional trade agreements um, that explicitly cover um, environmental related provisions referring to the agricultural sector. So in 2019, these were more than 70 regional trade agreements. So there's a clear indication for um, for awareness for this issue. So coming to, um, to the multilateral and also, also regional um, policy approaches to, to, promote, to promote sustainable development through trade, um, we have seen that food and agricultural trade has become more balanced around the world. Um, countries are today much more better connected than they used to be in 1995. And they have also become more resilient to shocks. But we've also seen that, um, that some vulnerabilities in the, in the agricultural market still remain. And uh, countries should seek to diversify, further diversify their import sources. And also, of course, to avoid fragmentation of the global market. We have had a look at the comparative advantage and trade costs as drivers that shape the geography of trade and we've seen that it's um, especially low income countries um, um, that, um, that should increase the productivity and also try to lower trade costs in order to promote trade and also economic development. You've seen that for, for this, both um, regional and multilateral trade agreements um, can be conducive, for example, trade facilitation and also the harmonization of, of standards. Uh, we know that um, regional trade agreements can create gains, uh, can, can uh, create gains, especially through promoting regional value chains. Um, but there's also risk that in negotiating in the negotiation pro process um, for regional trade agreements, that especially low income countries um, would be left out from the trade integration process. So, and in general, to uh, fully leverage. Um, gains globally through comparative advantage, it is multilateral trade reform that would be most con conducive, most beneficial, and which is also the most efficient way to promote market access and economic growth, economic development and inclusiveness for all countries in the world. Um, on the environmental side, we have seen that trade promotes food security and it helps countries overcome natural resources constraints it also has an efficiency enhancing on, uh, effect on natural resources use. And again, because um, natural resources are unequally distributed around the world, um, multilateral approaches um, would be needed to fully leverage um, this, this potential that trade has. At the same time, we've seen there can be negative environmental ex externalities, impacts of production for experts, for exports. And um, 
here it's again, it's multilateral rules and increasingly also regional trade agreements that can help address um, negative environmental impacts, but especially um, at, the, at the local levels so in the domestic market, so for localized environmental externalities, like for example, biodiversity loss or um, unsustainable freshwater withdrawals. However, for, for global challenges, what is needed are global solutions. Global environmental externalities such as climate change, greenhouse gas emissions that, that still happen in one country, but that would affect the, the whole world can only effectively be addressed, addressed by multilateral approaches. So that was a, a quick overview of SOCO 2022 and I thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for indeed a very comprehensive uh, presentation on, on this key flagship report, which indeed gives a, a very uh, insightful uh, perspective. And I see already some reaction, and there will be, uh, uh, I'm sure we'll be coming back to you, Andrea, with some questions toward, uh, toward the end, also looking at, um, at what has happened since the, you had the, late, the last data, uh, basically, uh, we have had the, the COVID uh, situation that is coming and now the, the war in the war in Ukraine. So it might be useful to, 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 to see how, how you see this uh, tendency and, um, and uh, evolving. So thank you again, Andrea. Uh, and today I must say we are very happy to, to have uh, with us Ambassador uh, Pitfield, uh, the, uh, with us, Ambassador Pitfield has been the permanent representative of Thailand to the WTO and WIPO since March 2021. She has a long career in this field, and, uh, and we are glad that Ambassador Pitfield will share our views from a government perspective on how trade policies based on both multilateral and regional approaches can address today's challenge for sustainable development. So, uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Actually, I was I thought that I would be uh, following the distinguished representative from uh, the, the Netherlands, who is the chair of uh, agriculture. But um, okay, um, <laughs> okay, I I did not uh, prepare a statement for this uh, um, panelist at all, but I did uh, a lot of um, catch up reading. So. Thank you very much to FAO for in, uh, inviting me to share perspective of Thailand uh, in agriculture um, today. I don't think I have uh, a lot of time. So what I was planning to do is uh, I, I, took, I read the, the report by FAO, which I found very interesting. Um, and um, maybe like Mr. Martin Fowler here, um, the report may not touching on uh, many new aspects that is happening around the world right now, but I think it uh, forms a good basis of where uh, agricultural trade uh, is right now and um, what are um, the things that maybe we have to, uh, to consider in the future. So I would, my, I want, I plan to talk briefly about um, the Thailand agriculture policy and then maybe touch uh, on the the current as the, the aspect in FTA versus WTO. And then I would uh, just um, try to be inspirational to you, like uh, Mr. Domini said, <laughs> we have to meet three eyes. Uh, what um, um, in informal, interactive, and inspirational, I'm not sure I can be inspirational, but I'll try my best. So let me start uh, very briefly on agriculture in Thailand. Um, we are uh, a major agrarian society still, uh, even though agriculture production as well as uh, export has decreased a lot um, since I started working in the Ministry of Commerce. Uh, right now it is uh, less than the, the GDP share of agriculture is less than 10%. Uh, uh, it's less than 10%, but uh, in terms of population, uh, we are still um, uh, between uh, 30, uh, 30 to 35 of uh, the Thai population is still engaged in agriculture and therefore agriculture trade and agriculture negotiations has always been an important part uh, when we negotiate a uh, trade agreement, be they at the WTO or uh, in FTA negotiations. But um, uh, among the, uh, the, the 14 um, FTAs that Thailand has, um, 
I, I would say that uh, agriculture remains a very sensitive sector, which I'm sure uh, this is the true uh, truth in many, many countries, the, even uh, develop or developing countries, uh, agriculture uh, remain uh, very sensitive. And so in, in Thailand's case, um, a lot of our commitment in FTA negotiations focus on uh, trying to gain market access to other countries, you know, uh, either to reduction of tariff or uh, as uh, negotiating for more like um, tariff quotas being uh, bigger and lower tariff uh, for our product, that kind of stuff. Um, but um, we, at least in our case, we do not uh, engage uh, too much on rule side of the uh, uh, of uh, agricultural trade in FTAs. And that's why uh, one aspect that I want to highlight from the report of FAO, which I found very, very interesting, uh, at least from Thailand's perspective, is that um, uh, it clearly points to the fact that trade costs are very high. Um, uh, the examples being of tariff, of course, but then there are also transportation, um, insurance, documentation, border measures, which I, I, I presume to be customs related, and standard compliance, which in Thailand's case as developing countries, exporting country, it's very, very costly, you know, trying to comply with um, uh, national standard of uh, trading partners as well as private standard. These are very challenging to us. So in terms of trade, we are doing well. We are major uh, world exporters in agricultural products. But back home, domestically, we are also facing with many challenges like aging population. We have fewer and fewer people who want to be farmers. You know, it's not very glamorous. Everybody wants to be YouTube influencer now. Nobody wants to do the hard work of farming. But um, I think this is uh, happening in many countries. So in Thailand, we have uh, refocused a bit. And maybe this is uh, a bit more futuristic, like Mr. Martin Fowler had said. Um, in our current uh, strategy for agriculture, we focus on, of course, um, upgrading and reskill, upskill our young smart farmers. You know, our okay, maybe they are not young, young, but uh, they are emerging new uh, kind of farmers. Do smart farming things. We bring in technology. We bring in data for our farming sectors to to upgrade them. In, uh, our aim is to do like less for more. We use smaller farming sector to produce more. Uh, that's, uh, that's the target. We also want to um, bring in, uh, redo some planning, but and also innovation and research and development is called for, you know, we have to do greater uh, product development, product diversification, um, but also uh, learning center, that kind of stuff. What I want to do uh, is uh, the path to the future, which is the, the last point I want to take is um, another thing which is emerging in Thailand's agriculture trade, um, which may not be um, uh, visible much in current FTA negotiation, but it will be, at least in the private sector, is the recognition that agriculture and food and uh, climate change or environment are related. So uh, our focus, um, uh, we, are, we are trying to do strategy on BCG, you know, bioeconomy, circular economy, and green economy. This is a strategy that uh, government and our private sectors are sharing the, the same vision, and we try to, to move uh, ahead. But we also have found that um, this strategy, which has been um, adopted in only uh, past, the past few years, we, it is it is costly, you know, compliance with environmental standard or expectation is always costly. We don't have access to technology uh, um, and uh, our uh, people are not uh, very well equipped to, uh, to go through this. Even like circular economy, which is a very admirable concept, it is not easy to implement in real life. Um, if, uh, if we have time, I can share experience that I went to see actual circular economy by the largest Thai sugar produ producer, which they take years to do circular economy. But uh, what I'm saying that um, there is a clear recognition that uh, agriculture is not uh, only food security, uh, but also it affects uh, agri uh, climate and environment. So our new current uh, policy is geared towards that. Uh, the last point is that, uh, of course, COVID and, um, and uh, and many things, and especially the war, has highlighted the, the, the importance of the concept of food security. Um, 
So we, we see and we support the, the decision at the WTO and we will try our best to do that. Um, um, the fact is, um, okay, in Thailand case, uh, food security is not our problem right now. We, we are net food exporting countries. We have uh, sufficient food, but we also have been affected by um, lack of inputs, you know, especially fertilizers. It's very expensive now in Thailand. So uh, the post COVID era, and also the the um the in the current uh, war uh, conflict that is going on, and we anticipate that it will continue for a while. Uh, we also have to rethink about how um uh, the policy on on climate, you know, and also food production and uh, our human resource and uh, everything can also serve uh, in the future uh, in terms of um, crisis. No, not uh, only a uh, pandemic or something, but uh, let's say the, the narrative and the, therefore the policy measures has to evolve with uh, these things. And um, mind you, it is not easy to move agriculture sector and uh, farming people, but um, um, I, I can uh, speak more in detail about food security, but I think I, I should stop here for now because Maybe uh, some other speakers have uh, additional views to share on this, uh, which I may come up uh, later to, to talk about uh, food security more. But that, that is the, the way that um, the Thai agriculture policy is. We are hopefully moving in the right direction, but it takes time and we need technology. We need to do a lot of work. And we also share view from SAO that trade costs can be reduced uh, and we would happily do see that they are done at the multilateral or regional level. So that's my my uh, my my thoughts for now. So thank you very much for the first one. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Ambassador, for these very pertinent insight and experience from uh, from Thailand. We would be keen to have you uh, in the future also talking of your experience of the circular economy you, you were referring to and, and others. But thank you again for being with us today and for sharing your your views and no and we will now hear from miss uh, michelle dielik uh, who is currently the acting executive director of agriculture and agri-food canada strategic uh, trade policy division uh, miss dielik uh, very pleased to have you with us today and the floor is yours thank you dominique uh, and thank you to Andrea and the fao for the excellent uh, report and the presentation i think it's a uh, it should be in the textbook of, of trade uh, courses, I think, for our, our university students who are going to be coming to work in, in the area of trade policy. Uh, you know, I think, first of all, I think you touch on, you know, many of the, the, the things that we're grappling with in Canada in terms of how to best use that regional level of strong cooperation combined with what we can do at the multilateral level to address, you know, the so many challenges that the, the global egg sector faces uh, with the pandemic, uh, with extreme weather events that are affecting production and food prices, and of course, with uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the impacts that's having on supply chains and food security. Uh, so for Canada, I, I think as some of your, your charts would have, would have indicated, uh, we're one of the largest exporters and importers of, of agricultural products in the world. In fact, uh, about half of what we produce in Canada is exported to over 200 countries. So we're very much dependent on an efficient trading system. We have a population of about 36 million. Uh, so we definitely produce a, a great surplus of food in Canada. So uh, from the perspective of our exporters and our producers, having a, a predictable, a transparent, uh, and a rules-based uh, multilateral trading system is really at the, at the core of what supports uh, our business uh, sectors and our, our individual producers. Uh, so when market access is predictable, of course, farmers and firms are able to make those investments uh, in their own operations and attract outside investment. So, as the ambassador from Thailand mentioned, uh, you know, access to te technology is critical uh, to continue to improve uh, productivity in Canada. Uh, producers access to, to new technologies, uh, new varieties for new crops, uh, clean technologies is imperative 
if we are collectively to reverse some of the downward uh, trajectories that we're seeing in agricultural productivity growth and to continue to build resilience into our, our food systems and sustainability into our food systems. Um, so Dominique, you mentioned at the start, of course, the, the, the minister's uh, decisions that were taken at the June uh, WTO ministerial conference. Uh, for Canada, those are, are critical uh, and, and successful to, to our efforts to kind of push uh, the envelope in the multilateral setting. Of course, ministers adopted a decision to exempt the non-commercial humanitarian purchases by the World Food Program to support its work to provide critical food assistance to the most vulnerable. Uh, the ministerial declaration on the emergency response to food insecurity recognizes the actions that members could take to promote and support food security. And of course, all this is, is critical to, I think, helping to, to address some of those systemic challenges that we're facing today. And so as noted in the FAO report, trade is one element of a number of various factors that can help us contribute to more sustainable development. Um, and among other things, we need to consider the role of technology and knowledge, which can promote productivity and growth. Uh, so, of course, innovative farming practices and technologies will be critical to meeting the challenge of feeding an additional 2 billion people by 2050. Uh, and innovation will be a key part of supporting the livelihoods and the sustainably growing our food on less land with fewer imports. Um, I would say, though, that one of the things I think um, in Canada that's that's most important is, you know, trying to use our FTA approaches and our multilateral approaches uh, to weave in some of the, you know, the things that we hope to see in terms of uh, environmental responsibility. Um, so on the subject of regional FTAs, uh, what we do as a, a Canadian government, uh, the government, uh, the government's assessments of the potential environmental impacts of a proposed FTA explore the linkages between the environment and the liberalization of trade, including for ag products. One of the objectives of the assessment is to assist negotiators to take into account environmental considerations uh, with a view to mitigate risk and enhance benefits. Uh, in addition, it supports the identification of possible needs for additional domestic measures to further mitigate uh, some of the environmental risks. So some examples uh, of what uh, we do in our regional FTAs, we include obligations to foster good environmental laws and foster good environmental governance, mandate the effective enforcement of environmental laws and regulations, and ensure that countries uh, do not compromise their environmental laws to attract trade or investment. In Canada, you know, the overarching, I think, emphasis and the lens through which we, we view everything these days, uh, including our domestic policy developments is sustainability. Uh, you, I'm sure it's the same in many of your capitals, but I think in every policy discussion, uh, how to achieve greater sustain, sustainability while achieving uh, you know, economic strength of the sector uh, is part of every discussion we have. So uh, at the core of, I think, our approach going, uh, looking ahead is research. So research is vital, of course, in, in all of our sectors. For us, uh, there are multiple uh, focuses of our research underway. One specific project that I'd like to highlight today that uh, is our attempt to sort of focus more on the regional challenges that we're facing and how to grow food more sustainably is what we call our Living Labs project, which is a $185 million 10-year program uh, that's establishing a, a Canadian-wide network of what we call Living Labs. So through these labs, regional leaders are bringing together farmers, scientists, and other sector partners to co-develop, uh, test, and monitor beneficial management practices on working farms uh, to, to see firsthand what's working in terms of improving productivity uh, while re reducing the environmental footprint in Canada to enhance uh, climate resiliency. Uh, so, I mean, with that, of course, Canada, as with the other members here, we're active not only in the, the WTO setting and the FAO setting, 
uh, in terms of the multilateral efforts to kind of start having more intensive discussions on trade sustainability. That includes as well as, uh, of course, the good work going on in the OECD and, and APEC. Uh, and I think the overarching, you know, takeaway that we've been experienced firsthand, especially as we consider how to improve the trade framework is that uh, it's very easy to try and take the simple cookie cutter approach to solving these problems. But I think what we're learning in Canada, including, you know, of a country with such a, a wide and varied landmass uh, as we face is that there's no one size fits all uh, solution that will make uh, achieving sustainability possible. So I think we have to be cognizant of that as trade policy people. Uh, that it's a very complex landscape and, and complex solutions are probably uh, what's needed to address some of the challenges that we face. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Ms. Uh, Birik, for, for sharing your, your Canadian perspective and uh, and for giving you or giving us an idea of all the work that is ongoing in Canada. So thank you very much for that. And our last panelist today is Mr. Marcel Vernoy, the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Mission of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to the WTO. And as you all know, I'm sure Mr. Vernoy is also the current chair of the WTO Committee on Agriculture. And as such, he will share with us his perspective on the topic within the context of the recent outcomes adopted by the by the 12th ministerial conference mr vernoy the floor is yours yes thank you uh, dominic for this uh, invitation uh, congratulations if uh, with an excellent uh, soco 2022 report uh, also if you allow me uh, speaking on behalf of the netherlands uh, i think uh, like like previous speaker we we applaud this report uh, i'm sure where the netherlands is a major producer and trader of uh, food and agriculture products. Uh, but perhaps more important, we consider ourselves to be a major partner in, um, in world trade in those products. So, um, but now indeed uh, continuing my capacity of, uh, of chairman of the committee on agriculture, I'd like to make a few remarks. Uh, um, though you encourage us to speak informally, of course, this is, uh, this is a bit more difficult as a chairman. So if, uh, if you bear with me, I. Uh, uh, I'll follow my notes and, and of course in the discussion I'm open for uh, for questions and remarks. So like you have mentioned in your reports, uh, clearly countries have different natural endowments and, and varied climate conditions uh, and this results in different opportunities to produce agriculture products and foods. Of course there's much more to it but this is the basic assumption and to focus on food international trade is critical for the movement of food from surplus to deficit areas. It's rather imperative to have a functional and reliable trade transmission belt. Uh, no part of the planet can be deprived of having access to food and your uh, World Food Day uh, motto, leave no one behind, of course, is, uh, is, is, is excellent in that respect. Uh, I think we cannot not sufficiently underline this uh, this this importance of, uh, of leaving no one behind and uh, feeding the world as a whole. Um, but also very few countries are self-sufficient to meet food demands of their citizens. So international trade fosters efficiency and competition in the use and allocation of natural resources. Uh, with the idea being that food is produced where it can be most efficiently produced. Uh, efficiency also means, of course, avoiding waste of uh, precious, of precious natural resources, and Mr. Simonman has, has alluded to that. The, the multilateral trading system and the WTO rules uh, seek to contribute to sustainable development and resilient global food systems, foremost by correcting and preventing uh, restrictions and distortions in world agriculture markets. Now, one important objective of these rules, as enshrined in the preamble of the Agreement on Agriculture, is to establish a fair and market-oriented agricultural trading system. The agreement launched an agriculture reform process towards correcting and preventing distortions in world agriculture markets. So countries' competitive energy efficiency and comparative advantage are not to be blunted by government's interventions in the agriculture sector. 
But America's agreement establishing the WTO in its preamble also recognizes the importance of making optimal use of the world's natural resources in accordance with the objectives of sustainable development and strive to protect and preserve the, the environment. So reference was already made to the uh, most recent 12th Ministerial Conference, the MC12, of course, in, in Geneva slang. So at MC12, the ministers adopted uh, this declaration on the emergency response to food insecurity, actually re reaffirming the importance of the food function and inputs, markets, and supply chains. Um, and they committed, and I quote, to take concrete steps to facilitate trade and improve the functioning and long-term resilience of global markets for food and agriculture, including cereals, fertilizers, and other uh, agriculture products and inputs. And ministers also underscored the need for agri-food trade to flow and reaffirm, reaffirm the importance of not imposing exports prohibition, prohibitions or restrictions in a manner consist, inconsistent with relevant WTO provisions. And finally, ministers also expressed their resolve to cooperate with a view to ensuring enhanced productivity and production, trade, availability and accessibility and affordability of food for those who need it, especially in humanitarian emergencies. And by the way, um, I note that this language is, is very comparable to the, um, to the objectives of also the, the FO. So it's good to see coherent approaches, of course, emerging in these, uh, these topics. Uh, in the declaration, uh, ministers acknowledged the need to give particular consideration to specific needs and circumstances of developing country members, especially uh, those of least developed countries and net food import importing developing countries. And ministers have mandated a work program to be elaborated on the species of the Committee on Agriculture to examine how the 1994 America's decision could be made more effective and operational and to inter alia consider the needs of those LDCs and FIDCs to increase their resilience in responding to acute food instability. I'm pleased to inform you that the committee has already begun discussions on the work program in its June and September meetings. And there are several ideas and themes which members put forward. Uh, we had a meeting yesterday uh, in an informal setting. Of course, this is this is not easy. These are very complicated issues, like uh, our Canadian colleague also said, um, and they cannot be fully separated also from the political discussions on how to move forward in the WTO and agriculture. But I remain uh, optimistic and convinced that we'll find a way of establishing this work program uh, over the next period. Uh, the declaration, uh, important to note, also attaches importance to transparency of international trade. It makes a special note of the interagency efforts hosted by the FAO in the form of the Agricultural Market Information System, AMIS, in enhancing agriculture market transparency and policy responses to food security. Uh, the declaration is an important expression of solidarity and uh, collective intent expressed at the highest decision-making um, level of the WTO to deal with the current food security challenges. Um, reference was already made also to the important decision by the ministers to uh, not impose export prohibitions or restrictions on food purchases by the World Food Programme for non-commercial humanitarian purposes consistent with their domestic food security needs. So in addition to the uh, impact of agriculture trade rules to enhance efficiency, uh, WTO members acknowledge the numerous challenges that global agricultural trade and market integration may pose on nature, the environment and, and climate. And, and both Canada and, and Thailand have already uh, provided some examples of the critical importance of those issues at the national level as well. Uh, the Committee on Agriculture has a fundamental role to monitor or review the implementation of commitments that members have assumed. And this review process is primarily undertaken on the basis of members' uh, notifications. And interestingly, over the recent years, members have more and more relied on uh, the so-called Articles 18.6 process of the agreement to raise matters, not necessarily only based on notifications, but uh, uh, they have posed questions uh, which have been answered by, uh, by other delegations with a bearing on the agriculture reform program under the WTO. And if you follow that debate, 
Um, you may find that members have focused on several national agriculture policies and their relationship with environmental chapters. So there's a genuine effort um, among members to better understand these policies, to appreciate how they relate to or complying with the current WTO rules. And of course, sometimes members uh, raise concerns on possible negative effects of policies of measures, especially when there's an international dimension associated with it. Uh, but the Profiti does provide a good form to distill members' experience on such agri-environmental policies in a constructive and consultative setting. I've referred also to the negotiations on new agricultural disciplines. And also there you see major efforts to properly address contemporary challenges, including uh, food security and uh, sustainable development. Uh, perhaps uh, you are aware that there's a going to be a retreat on agriculture on the 24th of October, where members would collectively engage in a brainstorm setting on issues surrounding the agricultural negotiations, which of course have been unsuccessful for, uh, for a long term uh, time, uh, as, as you all know. Uh, Director General Ngozi, Dr. Ngozi, at the last week's General Council stated that she believes the retreat would be an exercise in telling us what is really happening on the ground and challenging us to see how we should factor these developments into the way we approach agriculture negotiations in the future. So before I close, uh, let me again thank you, Dominique, and the FO team here and also in Rome for your contribution to the World Trade Organization. You offer the WTO membership ship uh, very rich written papers for the co-debates, for example, also over the past years uh, on COVID-19 and all kinds of other food security related matters. We, of course, uh, are expecting uh, more from you to come. So we are very much encouraging you to continue your contribution and participation, including in this work program for LDCs and, and Net Food Importing Developing Countries. Uh, and we were delighted with yesterday's technical workshop at the Food and Agriculture Organization. Indeed, on this issue of fertilizer, the ambassador of Thailand already mentioned the critical importance of, uh, of sharing information on the global situation in fertilizers. And again, also there, the FO contributed uh, with an excellent analysis of the situation. This initiative was, by the way, or, uh, organized by, by, by Chile. So we'll keep you informed and we look forward to uh, to your continued cooperation, both from my side as a chair, but also on behalf of the WTO Secretariat. Thank you for the excellent cooperation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vernoy, for your, for your intervention, for providing us your perspective and on the what has been achieved at, uh, uh, at MC12, but also looking forward to the, the work that is to come. And, uh, and I can assure you that uh, that as FAO, we are committed to, to keep doing our work in uh, informing, providing the evidence for the, the, uh, that really feeds into the negotiation. And by the way, the, the dialogue series uh, that is taking place on uh, agricultural trade is done, of course, uh, in close cooperation with the market and trade division of, uh, of FAO that are really the, the one uh, generating a lot of this information that we are uh, discussing. So thank you again uh, for being with us. And uh, I will now move to the, the Q&A uh, session. And I see that we have received some. Some have been already addressed uh, directly. But uh, there is a question that perhaps can go straight to uh, to uh, to Andrea, and uh, which is coming from Mr. Fowler, uh, which is uh, which reads as follows. Shouldn't the focus now be on the post-2019 era? admittedly based on this very interesting and useful historical perspective. It will be fascinating to see what has happened in all of these relationships in light of the pandemic and not in light of the, of the conflict. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there has been, uh, there has been a, a report on, uh, on the impact of COVID on trade, which you have authored uh, also, uh, Andrea. So you may want to, uh, to, to give us a bit more on that. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Dominic. Thank you very much, Mr. Fowler, for this interesting question. Um, it is true that in the report, we have really focused on the long-term development. So we looked at the 1995, the establishment of the WTO until 2019. And again, the objective was to, uh, to identify long-term developments um, 
main structural changes in the network of food and agricultural trade and the main drivers behind that. It is true that since then, um, we've had a global pandemic and we now have a deep crisis um, through, through the war in, in Ukraine. So the, they are completely there, sort of new risks to the, um, to, to the network. And um, especially for COVID-19, um, we have seen that um, the, the network of food and agricultural trade has actually been extremely resilient. So um, we have done a lot of research on that in, in our division, several uh, reports or papers have come out of the, um, on, on this issue. And um, what we could very clearly see, there was a disruption, um, a, a strong disruption of food and agricultural trade, but only at the very beginning of the pandemic. So it was really, it was March and April 2020, um, basically when, when all, most of the countries in the world had started um, their lockdowns. And, um, and of course that was a massive disruption for all markets. And we also could see this, this decline, a clear drop in food and agricultural trade. Um, but um, back then, of course it was, um, it was very important, we you know, for food security to keep food and agricultural trade flowing. And there has been a lot of engagement from, from all stakeholders worldwide, especially also from the, from the international community to, to make this happen, to keep markets open and to keep trade flowing. And um, so what we saw was really a disruption in, in two months in 2020 from caused by the pandemic. But then again, um, immediately after that, a strong recovery. And at least at global level, um, there have been no other major disruptions um, caused by the pandemic in 2020 or in 2021 any, anymore. Actually, for this report, we, we again had a look at the data, but it was all smooth. Then, of course, in 2022, it, um, it was the, the war that, that hit agricultural markets that affects um, large players in the market. And we've seen already in the report, in the slides that I've shown today, is that um, that especially in, in the networks, in, in the food groups that are exported by, by Ukraine and, and by Russia, there's a strong um, concentration in the markets and there are strong dependencies um, at, at, global level, at global level. So um, what is important we've seen in the pandemic and we see again now um, in this um, geopolitical crisis is, um, to, to closely monitor what is going on in the markets and also in the policies and to do everything um, on, on behalf of the, of the international community to keep markets open and to keep, tra uh, to keep trade flowing. And this is what we see also Mr. Bernard from the WTS has mentioned um, that this is exactly what is happening or what is high up on the agenda also at WTO level. Um, so again, market monitoring, close collaboration. I don't think that um, at the moment that there have been deeper structural changes already in, in the network of food and agricultural trade. But this of course, for sure not from the pandemic, but of course for, for the war, we need, we need to see how this is going to, to involve. Of course, there's a risk of, of, of fragmenting markets. We've seen that also with regionalization tendencies. But, uh, but at the moment, um, we, we cannot really um, we, we cannot really know how this will um, evolve. Um, the last part of the question um, is: This going to continue? Of course, we, we don't know. <laughs> we know there's apparently a higher risk um, to have more global pandemics. We don't know how COVID nineteen is, is going to evolve. Um, we don't know the geopolitical situation. So these are all risks that can affect all markets in general. But what we know for sure is um, that we will see more impacts on climate change. And there's no question around this. So this is something that really needs to, to be addressed and it also needs to be addressed at the, at the global level. Yeah, indeed, a lot of uncertainties. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. We have another question that you may want to address, but also perhaps the other speakers, which uh, relates to uh, 
multilateral negotiation in agriculture, which have indeed been slow. And uh, as we have seen, instead, regional trade agreements have proliferated uh, rapidly. How does this affect agricultural trade? And, and what are the implications for sustainable development? I don't know if one of our panelists wants to take it. Or, uh, um, I may not, uh, sorry. Yeah, I was, uh, I wanted to talk shortly about two more points, which may not directly answer the question, but I want to raise about um, our experience in multilateral and uh, regional or FTA. What I have noticed is um, that um, um, for, for FTA, um, I think they both have different roles, at least that is my, my view uh, from experience. When we talk about sustainability issues like environment, labor, and um, uh, even climate change now, uh, at least from Thailand's experience, we are seeing more uh, movement quicker in, uh, in FTA negotiations. Uh, uh, we currently, maybe we don't have a, a very extensive chapters on environment uh, yet, but um, there are more of them than in the WTO. But having said this, uh, so, so my, 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 my two cents of thoughts for now is that for sustainability issue, there are some room and some uh, understanding to move quicker in, in, in FTA or bilateral or regional, because maybe because it is easier to, fo to foresee the, uh, the consequence, you know, you're doing it with limited numbers of uh, trading partners. So uh, it is uh, easier. But uh, having said this, I still think that uh, WTO has important role to play, not because I am ambassador to WTO, but um, there are, it is true that uh, certain multilateral issues need a multilateral uh, consultation. And uh, on this, I don't want to talk about environment, but let's say um, um, things that has been raised in the report about the vulnerability of some countries uh, developing country, especially uh, LDC and food importing countries, you know, like um, the report correctly uh, highlighted the fact that like uh, in Africa, they're highly dependent on uh, imports of uh, specific products uh, from certain uh, countries, not even in their own region. And uh, from experience of Thailand, who has uh, many neighbors as uh, in LDC's countries, uh, we recognize that there are challenges still, but uh, there are, I would say there are also potentials. Um, but um, uh, the, the, the COVID and the war have complicated uh, people uh, from these countries. So we need to discuss it uh, in multilateral setting to make uh, food security and uh, how to address the vulnerability of certain of some countries, you know, I think um, they have to uh, be horizontal. So uh, I would prefer that these issues related to food security be taken up in a committee on agriculture, which Thailand will participate. So uh, there are roles to play, but uh, maybe certain issues are moving faster here and there. But um, yeah, that's uh, my two cents of thought. Thank you, sorry. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. Anybody else willing to contribute to Mr. Verdun? Yes, of, of course, the, the best thing for us to discuss uh, Africa would be for the African delegates to, to, to come forward. But I, I think a few elements are critical. First, the, the population on the African continent is expected to, to, to continue to grow quite rapidly. And uh, also in the report, I think uh, Mrs. Simamang, you've highlighted the, the, the vulnerability uh, in Africa uh, on climate change, water shortages, and so on. So, so we, need, we need to continuously to focus on, uh, on providing support for the African continent as a whole. And of course, within that, all, all its diversity uh, at the national and, and local, local level. Um, productivity of agriculture has to increase in a, in a, in a climate smart, environmentally sound manner. Bringing, by the way, a lot of opportunities for uh, for business, also small businesses in the agro food sector. The ambassador Pitfield has alerted to the critical importance to keep agriculture, of course, spot on. Also for young entrepreneurs, etc. This is this is critical, even more, I think, for the African continent. Uh, 
because if farmers are producing, um, but then their products are not reaching the consumers and there's a, a huge gap between, of course, the, the countryside and cities, cities also in Africa. So this whole production based, uh, of course, the FO is, is, is a key partner in that process. But if, like I said, we need a multiple strategy. We need global trades to continue to, to help feed Africa. Um, the uh, pro projections for, for, for import is that Africa will become more and more a net food importer. At the same time, we should also cherish and be proud of the tremendously important products that come from the African continent. And of course, we should not only see this as an aid relationship, we should see this as a true economic uh, opportunity. The Netherlands being one of the biggest importers of cocoa, of course, we, we collaborate with Ghana and Ivory Coast. And, and, and this is such a critical asset, of course, of the African continent that we, uh, we, we should cherish. And then coming, of course, to the, uh, the question. Yes, the, the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement is excellent. It builds upon the existing regional processes in, in East Africa and South Africa, etc. But this, this is very important also. And uh, the report you have presented, uh, Dominique, shows the uh, trade costs in Africa between countries, which are way out of context. I think uh, hopefully this, uh, this, this excellent initiative uh, for an African free trade area will help to reduce those trade costs, with, which will have a huge impact also again for, for the benefits to, to farmers and consumers. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Arnoy. I don't see anybody else willing to to take the floor. So, uh, so let me go to the, the conclusion then. And, uh, and uh, well, we have heard today about the, indeed the geography of food and agricultural trade, including the globalization and regional integration, uh, fundamental drivers of trade, role of natural resources and impact on trade, policy approach for trade to contribute to sustainable growth. We have the opportunity to discuss how trade policies based on both multilateral and regional approach can be used to address challenges for sustainable development. Of course, this in view of the recent outcomes of the MC12. Uh, I would like uh, to really express my sincere gratitude to all the distinguished speakers today. Uh, we dedicate their valuable time to be with us uh, this afternoon, this morning for Canada. And I, I would also like to, to thank our colleagues of course, as I mentioned already in the FAO market and trade division, and of course, in my office, the FAO in Geneva office for organizing this webinar. Uh, last but not least, our gratitude goes to the, the participants for taking the time to, to join us today. 